Hey there, seventh graders. It's Mr. Washington again, and it's time for another video lesson. Today, we're going to be talking about poetry. Okay, so automatically some of you are worried. I know, I know, poetry can be confusing. All that fancy language and things that don't mean what they sound like they mean. The truth is that poetry can be confusing, but it becomes easier if you know what you're looking for. What makes a poem? What types of poems are there? What things can be found in a poem? That's what we'll be looking at today. So grab a writing tool and something to write on as we prepare to explore the elements of poetry. The first thing we'll need is a set of Cornell notes like this one. We'll be using a set of fill in the blank closed notes like this one in class, but any old sheet of paper will do. You'll want to begin by writing your name, class and period, and date in the upper right hand corner. The next thing you'll want to do is write the topic at the top of the page, just to the left of where you wrote your name, right about here. The topic, of course, is the elements of poetry. Now let's take a look at today's objective. You don't need to write down the objective, just be aware of what it is. Today's objective is that we want to be able to recognize and analyze the impact of an author's choice of poetic devices, and there are a lot of devices to talk about. Now that we know that, we're ready to look at our essential guiding question. Now throughout this video, there will be times where you'll need to write something in your notes and times when you won't. So we'll use this little icon here. If you see this icon, there's something important enough to write down. If you don't see the icon, then you don't need to write, but you do need to listen. There are two essential guiding questions for today's lesson, and we'll need to write them both down. The first question is, what are the elements of poetry? The second question is, what qualities do all good poems have in common? We'll want to write these at the top of the page, just next to where it says, Essential Guiding Question. So your notes should look something like this. Once we have those questions written down, we're ready to proceed. Poems are an important type of literature. You'll often find them on reading tests and end of course tests like the Virginia Standards of Learning Test or SOL. But sometimes they can be difficult to read and understand. It helps if you can define a concept, but poetry can be difficult to define. A poem is an emotional experience, both for the writer and the reader. It is a thought or feeling transmitted by imagination into images and expressed in a beautiful and usually patterned language. If we want to discover a good definition of poetry, maybe we should look at how poets define poetry. Let's look at poetry in the words of poets. Let's begin with Robert Frost, considered by many to be one of the most important and influential poets in American history. According to Robert Frost, poetry is when an emotion has found its thought and the thought has found words. Okay, that's interesting, but it doesn't really give us a good definition. Let's try somebody else. Edgar Allan Poe, he of the weirdly large forehead, said that poetry is the rhythmical creation of beauty in words. Again, it sounds nice, but it doesn't really help us develop a definition. Who else we got? Khalil Gibran, a Lebanese-American poet, writer, and visual artist, said that poetry is a deal of joy and pain and wonder with a dash of the dictionary. Good, but not good enough. Let's try another poet. Carl Sandburg said that poetry is an echo asking a shadow to dance. Okay, that's just plain confusing. Leave it to poets to make poetry even more confusing than it already is. Emily Dickinson 
this lady here, said that if I read a book and it makes my whole body so cold, no fire can ever warm me, I know that is poetry. Now, if you know anything about Emily Dickinson, you know that quote makes perfect sense, but it still doesn't give us a workable definition. On to the next poet. Whitman, with his scruffy beard, said, to have great poets, there must be great audiences. Now, that makes sense. Maybe poetry is easier to understand if we come from a place where we are as knowledgeable as the person writing the poem. And that's what this whole note-taking exercise is about. So now we're ready to actually define poetry. Here's our definition. Poetry is defined as a piece of writing that usually has figurative language and that is written in separate lines that often have repeated rhythm and sometimes rhyme. Now, poetry is the opposite of prose, another important term, which is the ordinary form of spoken or written language. Short stories, novels, essays, etc. would be an example. Up until this point, everything we've studied in this class has been considered prose. There are five things to look at when reading a poem, five elements that we will be concerned with as we read some poems in class. Let's write them down, then we'll look at each one individually together. Those elements are form, speaker, sound devices, imagery, and figurative language. By the way, figurative language is something we've already spent some time in class talking about. So if you haven't already done so, you may want to view my other video on different types of figurative language because this video will be referring back to those figurative language devices. Okay, let's take a look at each of these important elements. The first element of poetry is form. And form is the first thing we see when we look at a poem. Form refers to the way a poem looks on the page. There are four things to consider when examining the form of a poem. The first thing we look at are lines. Lines are rows of words in a poem. Lines in poetry are very different from prose because they end whenever the poet wants them to end, and they may not be complete sentences. Maybe a sentence spills over into several lines, or maybe a line contains more than one sentence. When lines are grouped together, we get our second element of form, which is a stanza. Stanzas are groups of lines in a poem separated by a space. Stanzas are like the paragraphs of a poem. Stanzas can vary in length depending on the whims of the author, but there are some names for different types of stanzas. One type of stanza is the couplet, which is simply a pair of lines that rhyme. Another common type of stanza is the quatrain, which is a stanza consisting of four lines. Quatrains usually rhyme, but not always. The best way to look at these two terms is by examining the word parts contained in both. The word couplet comes from the word couple, meaning two. And the word quatrain comes from the root word quad or qua, which means four, as in the word quarter. Therefore, couplets have two lines, and quatrains contain four lines. Now that we know what form is, let's take a look at some poems and examine their forms. Go ahead and put your pencil down and rest your hand for a while as we examine the forms of a few poems. Our first poem is titled, Is the Moon Tired? and it's written by Christina Rossetti. The poem reads, Is the moon tired? She looks so pale within her misty veil. She scales the sky from east to west and takes no rest. Before the coming of the night, the moon shows papery white. Before the dawning of the day, she fades away. Let's start by looking at the lines. How many lines does this poem have? If you said eight lines, you are correct. There are four lines in the first stanza, and there are another four lines in the second stanza for a total of eight. What about the stanzas? Well, if we have four lines in each stanza, then we also have two quatrains, 
one here, and one here. In this case, the quatrains also contain rhyme, the words pale, veil, west, and rest. And I also spy with my little eye a bit of personification, giving human qualities to the moon. Let's take a look at another example. The name of this poem is Enter This Deserted House. Okay, that that's that's a little creepy. That's, that sound is kinda kinda creeping me out. It's is it okay, wait. Okay, it's over now. Alright. Um this poem is called Enter This Deserted House, and it's written by Shel Silverstein. The poem reads Enter this deserted house, but please walk softly as you do. Frogs dwell here, and crickets too. Ain't no ceiling, only blue. Jays dwell here, and sunbeams too. Floors are flowers, take a few. Ferns grow here, and daisies too. Swoosh, swoosh, to wit to woo. Bats dwell here, and hoot owls too. Ha ha ha! Hee hee! Hoo hoo! Gnomes dwell here, and goblins too. And my child, I thought you knew, I dwell here, and so do you. Now this poem looks very different from our last example. We have 12 lines divided into groups of two each, meaning that we have a total of six couplets here, 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 and here. That's what we mean by form, lines, and stanzas. Now when we talk about form, we can classify poems into groups based on the form of the poem. There are many different poetic forms in the world of literature, but we're going to simplify matters by looking at four basic poetic forms. The first type of form is called a ballad. A ballad is a poem with a regular repeated pattern, sort of like a song. Ballads are also sometimes called structured form poetry or lyric poetry. But no matter what you call them, the important thing is that they have a pattern, and usually that pattern consists of rhyming lines and even a specific rhythmic pattern. Ballads are very different from our second type of poem, which is called free verse. Free verse refers to a poem with no regular pattern. Free verse poems will lack things like rhyme, rhythm, and meter. Our third type of poem is a haiku. Haikus are distinguished by their syllable pattern. All haikus have a syllable pattern of 575. This means that there are five syllables in the first line, seven syllables in the second line, and five syllables again in the third line. The last type of poem that we'll be looking at is a limerick. A limerick is a humorous five-line rhyming poem with the rhyme scheme A-A-B-B-A. -B -B -A. Now, in order for us to be able to understand a limerick, we have to be able to understand rhyme scheme. So let's take a quick look at what that means. Rhyme scheme is a way of showing the pattern of rhymes in a poem using letters. Each line of the poem gets a letter starting with the first letter of the alphabet, which is of course A. Now for every new rhyme sound we encounter, we go up one letter in the alphabet. So let's see what this looks like using one of the world's most famous poems, Roses Are Red, Violets are blue. Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you, so the poem says. So the first line in this case, roses are red, will always get a letter A. Now we look at the second line, violets are blue. Does this line have the same rhyming sound at the end as the first line? No, it does not. This means we assign it a different letter than the line that came before it, the next letter of the alphabet, which is B. Our third line is sugar is sweet. Does this rhyme with line one? Nope. What about line two? Also no. So since it does not rhyme with any line that precedes it, we move on to the next letter of the alphabet, which would be C. 
Then we move on to our last line. And so are you. Does this line rhyme with roses are red? It does not. Does it rhyme with violets are blue? Wait a minute, it does. Blue and you have the same long O sound. So since lines four and two rhyme, they both get the same letter, which in this case is the letter B. So the rhyme scheme of this poem is A, B, C, B. That's what we mean by rhyme scheme. All right, so we got ballads, free verse, haiku, and limerick. Let's take a look at an example of each. Put your pencil down again. We're going to read some more poems. Let's take a look at a structure form poem or ballad. This ballad is written by Langston Hughes, considered by many to be the most accomplished African-American poet who ever lived. This poet is titled Dreams. It reads, Hold fast to dreams. For if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. This would be considered a ballad because it has a specific pattern. It has two stanzas of four line each, meaning it contains two quatrains. The pattern in this case is the rhyme of the poem. The second line in each stanza rhymes with the fourth line. In stanza one, fly rhymes with die, and snow rhymes with go. This means that the poem has a rhyme scheme of A, B, C, B. If there were to be a third stanza of this poem, it would have to conform to the same pattern, meaning that it would have four lines, and that line two and four of that stanza would have to rhyme. You get it? I'm also noticing that this poem contains a figurative language device. Do you see it? It's a metaphor, and it's located in lines three and seven. Line three says that life is a broken winged bird, comparing life to an injured bird in a way that it does not move. And line seven says, life is a barren field, comparing a life without dreams to a field with no life. So this poem not only follows a pattern, but it contains metaphor as well. Our next type of poem is a free verse poem, and it looks radically different from our last example. Free verse poems have no pattern, so they read differently than ballads. This poem is titled, The Morning Walk, and it's written by Mary Oliver. It reads, There are a lot of words meaning thanks. Some you can only whisper. Others you can only sing. The peewee whistles instead, the peewee being a type of bird. The snake turns in circles. The beaver slaps its tail on the surface of the pond. The deer in the pine woods stamps his hoof. Goldfinches shine as they float through the air. A person, sometimes, will hum a little Mahler, Mahler being a composer, meaning that you would hum a classical song, or put arms around old oak tree, or take out lovely pencil and notebook to find a few touching, kissing words. Notice how different this poem looks and sounds. There's only one stanza, and there's no rhythm or rhyme. The line links very greatly from line 6, which is very short, to line 12, which is considerably longer. Free verse poems gives the writer the freedom to structure the poem however they choose, which doesn't mean that they don't put time and effort into writing the poem. It just means that they are more focused on their word choice than they are on their form. Let's look at another type of poem. Our third type of form is a haiku. We said that a haiku contains three lines and that there is a specific type of syllable pattern in each line. Let's read this haiku by David Harmer titled Uphill. 
My battered bike groans. Two wandering wheels wobble. Twisted spokes shout no. This is a haiku because it contains three lines and it has the requisite number of syllables in each line. Line one contains five syllables. My battered bike groans. Line two contains seven syllables. Two wandering wheels wobble. And line three contains five syllables. Twisted spokes shout no. Hey, in addition to syllables, I'm noticing another figurative language device. Do you see it? It's in lines one and three. Did you say personification? If you did, then you are correct. In line one, it reads, my batter bike groans. A bike cannot groan. A groan is a noise made by the mouth of a living thing. It also said, twisted spokes shout no. This is also an example of personification because spokes, the little wires in the wheels of your bike, are inanimate objects, so they cannot speak any more than a bike can groan. So this haiku contains two examples of personification. The last type of poem we'll be discussing today is called a limerick. Limericks are silly little poems that are generally meant to be funny. They have a specific rhyme scheme and a certain rhythm, so all limericks sort of sound the same. Our example is titled, conveniently enough, Limerick. It's written by John Irwin, and it's a limerick about, well, limericks. It reads, a limerick's cleverly versed. The second line rhymes with the first. The third one is short. The fourth the same sort. And the last line is often the worst. This poem is a limerick not only because of the title, but because it has that trademark rhyme and rhythm. The rhyme scheme is, of course, A, A, B, B, A. Lines 1, 2, and 5 rhyme with one another, as do lines 3 and 4. The poem itself tells you how limericks are structured, with lines 3 and 4 being shorter than the others, and the last line having some sort of silly little punchline. Those are our four major types of poems, ballads, free verse, haikus, and limericks. Let's get back to talking about the elements of poetry. So far we've only touched on one of our elements, form. Now let's move on to our second element, sound devices. The term sound device refers to things the writer uses to make the poem sound more interesting and pleasing to the ear. There are five sound devices that we will look at some of which we've already touched on earlier. The first sound device, of course, is rhyme. And rhyme is what most people think about when they think about poems. Rhyme is defined as repeating similar sounds at the ends of lines. And it's the first thing we think of when we think of poetry, though as we've seen, not all poems will necessarily rhyme. Our next sound device is rhythm. Rhythm is defined as a pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables in lines of poetry. We hear rhythm in poems like limericks or ballads, which have a noticeable beat to them. When we say stressed and unstressed syllables, it means that the writer positions words so that the syllables of each word create a certain rhythm. The first syllable is short, while the second syllable is long, sort of like a heartbeat. Short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long, like that. Our third sound device is called repetition. This is when a poet deliberately repeats words, phrases, or even whole lines or stanzas. Usually authors repeat things for emphasis. The more you say it, the more important it must be and the more likely your reader will notice it. Next, we have alliteration. Alliteration means repeating the same consonant sounds at the beginning of words. An example would be Molly makes mounds of muffins. 
Our consonant sound in this example is the letter M. A consonant, by the way, being a letter other than a vowel, so anything other than A, E, I, O, or U. With alliteration, words with the same consonant sounds are located in close proximity to one another. Alliteration is often misidentified as a figurative language device. It is not figurative language, since with figurative language you mean something other than what you say. So we refer to it as a sound device. Our last sound device is our old friend onomatopoeia. And I have to take my time when pronouncing that word because it's very hard to pronounce. Onomatopoeia is defined as using words that imitate sounds. So words like bang, boom, and pow are all examples. Like alliteration, onomatopoeia is often mistakenly referred to as figurative language. It's technically not figurative because, again, figurative language is language that's not meant to be taken literally. Bang, boom, and pow don't have alternate literal meanings, so we wouldn't consider them figurative language. We would instead consider them sound devices. How about we look at some sound devices in one of the poems we read earlier? Earlier we read the poem, Enter This Deserted House. Okay, there's that creepy sound again. Scraping me out. I think it's almost over. Almost over. Now it's over. Shel Silverstein is famous for writing poems with lots of sound devices, so it makes sense to look at one of his poems. Let's read the poem a second time, this time looking for any of our sound devices. Enter this deserted house, but please walk softly as you do. Frogs dwell here and crickets too. Ain't no ceiling, only blue. Jays dwell here and sunbeams too. Floors are flowers, take a few. Ferns grow here and daisies too. Swoosh, swoosh, to wit, to woo. Bats dwell here and hoodles too. Ha ha ha, he he, hoo hoo. Gnomes dwell here and goblins too. And my child, I thought you knew. I dwell here, and so do you. So, what sound devices do you see? Well, when I look at this poem, the first thing I notice is that it has rhyme. Every line rhymes with the one before, and since we have exactly the same rhyme sound, the poem would have a rhyme scheme of A, 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 because there's no other rhyming sound. I also notice that it has rhythm. Lines like, floors are flowers, take a few, ferns grow here, and daisies too, have that stressed unstress on and off heartbeat type rhythm and that rhythm exists throughout the poem. Additionally, this poem has repetition. Certain words are repeated throughout and every other line. Frogs dwell here and crickets too. Jays dwell here and sunbeams too. The words here and too are repeated throughout, helping to contribute to the rhythmic feel of the poem. This poem also contains examples of alliteration, repeating the same consonant sound. We see alliteration in line 5, floors are flowers, take a few, with the F sound being repeated. And we see it again in line 9, ha ha ha, he he, hoo hoo, with the H sound being repeated. Finally, this poem contains examples of onomatopoeia. For example, line 7 reads, swoosh, whoosh, to wit, to woo. These are verbal representations of the sound of a bat flying, swoosh, whoosh, and an owl hooting, to wit, to woo. So this poem actually contains an example of all five of our sound devices. Back to our elements of poetry. Our third element is called speaker. The speaker of the poem is the person who's doing the talking in the poem, the person whose voice we actually hear. The speaker is a lot like the narrator of a story. It's important to note that just like the author of a story is not necessarily the same as the narrator, 
The same also holds true for poems. The speaker is not necessarily the same as the author of the poem. Our fourth element of poetry is called imagery. Imagery is language that appeals to the reader's five senses. These details help the reader see, smell, hear, touch, and even taste what is being described. A good poet paints a picture in your mind and uses words to show you what's going on rather than to tell you. The last element of poetry is something we spent some time discussing earlier and that's figurative language. In one of our previous video lessons, we define figurative language as when writers use words or phrases to help readers picture ordinary things in new ways. It's the opposite of literal language, so figurative language devices aren't meant to be taken literally. Now, we've already spent a ton of time in class talking about figurative language, so we won't retread that here. The important thing to keep in mind is that you'll often find figurative language in poems. So in your notes, go ahead and write down the definition of figurative language and list those five important figurative language devices. As a reminder, they were simile, metaphor, hyperbole, personification, and idiom. If by chance you haven't seen that video, be sure to visit my YouTube channel and look for Cornell Notes on Figurative Language. Did I just advertise one of my videos in this video? Yes, I did. And with that, we've identified our major elements of poetry. Of course, no Cornell note sheet would be complete without a summary at the end. This is where we take a moment to reflect on what you've learned by reviewing the most important concepts you took notes on. Take a moment to summarize what you wrote in your notes. To help you out, your summary should answer the essential question we started out with, which was, what are the elements of poetry? Now that we know what they are, take a moment to look back at your notes, then write them in your summary. To get you started, your summary should begin with the words, the elements of poetry are. Once you've written them down in your summary section, then your Cornell notes are complete. And so concludes our video lesson on the elements of poetry. Wow, that was a lot, wasn't it? Now comes the hard part, actually reading poems. Difficult, I know, but hopefully now that you know what we're looking for, those poems you'll have to read will be a bit less intimidating. But let's save that for another day. These notes should be placed in your binder and should be used to help you better understand the poems you'll be encountering over the next few classes. Thanks for joining me for this video lesson. Until next time, this is Mr. Washington saying, see you later, seventh grader.